Hi everyone, welcome to a brief introduction to causal inference. In this talk, I'll be giving you a preview of the first few weeks of the course. My main goal is to focus on motivation and intuition. This talk isn't meant to give you a complete understanding of all of the topics that I cover. I'm going to try to cover a decent number of topics so that you'll get a good idea of what some of the basics of causal inference are, but you won't get a complete understanding of these topics until the first few weeks of the course. You might have in mind some machine learning topics like out-of-distribution generalization, and you might be interested in how causal inference is related to those. Those won't appear in this talk because they're not some of the basics of causal inference, but they will appear later in the course. All right, so with that, let's get started. What is causal inference? Causal inference is mainly about inferring the effect of one thing on another thing. So the you could be inferring the effect of any treatment, policy, or intervention, for example. Some examples are if you want to infer the effect of a treatment on a disease, or say you want to reduce emissions, and you have multiple different climate change policies to do this. You might want to pick the policy that is most effective at reducing emissions. So it causes the largest reduction in emissions. Similarly, say you notice that there is this rising mental health uh, bad outcomes. And you think that social media might be one of the important causes of this. So you could try to do a causal analysis to see how important social media is in contributing to this problem maybe what percentage of the problem it uh, contributes. And there's many more. So just generally, if you have any X that you want to talk about the effect of on some Y, that's what causal inference is for. So here is the outline slide. We're first going to give a motivating example, which is Simpson's paradox. You might have heard of this before, and it turns out that the causal structure of the problem is absolutely essential in resolving Simpson's paradox. Then we'll talk about why correlation does not imply causation. You've probably heard this before, but hopefully I'll be, give you a bit more understanding of why this is the case and what kind of important implications this has. And then in the last part of the talk, we'll talk about observational studies. So an observational study is when you just are given data. You're not able to make any experiments. And um, this is where a lot of causal inference research takes place these days. All right, so with that, let's get into our motivating example, Simpson's paradox. Say that in a purely hypothetical scenario, there is a new disease, COVID-27, and there are two treatments for the disease, A and B, which we'll code as 0 and 1. And it's your job to decide which treatment to choose for your country. And the only thing you care about is minimizing death. So which treatment will cause the smallest number of people to die or uh, will help the largest number of people live. And an important thing about these two treatments that we will use in this uh, example is that treatment B is much more scarce than treatment A. Another thing that you have data on, so you're getting data just from your doctors in your country, they're administering treatments and then they're collecting data on what happens when they give those treatments. Another thing that you have data on is the condition of each patient, whether they come in with a mild condition or a severe condition, which will also code as zero or one. And then finally, there's the outcome, why your patients will either be alive or dead. And in all of these cases, we're only looking at binary variables, but in general, there's a theme in causal inference where you can extend analysis from binary variables to, say, continuous variables or uh, multiple outcomes, say. So here is what your data looks like at the treatment level. Among people who were given treatment A, 16% of them died. So that's 240 people out of 1,500. 1,500 people got treatment A, and 240 of them died. And then among people who got treatment B, 19% of them died. So just, just looking at this, it seems like treatment A is doing a bit better than treatment B. You know, 3% fewer people die. But then something interesting happens when you subgroup the data by condition. 
So if you look at patients who have mild condition, 15% of those who are given treatment A die, compared to only 10% of those who are given treatment B. So treatment B actually looks better among the patients who had mild condition. And it's the same thing with patients who have the severe condition, actually. You have only 20% mortality rate. Only 20% of people died when they, um, of people who had severe condition and received treatment B. Whereas a larger 30% of people who had severe condition and received treatment A died. So how, is, um, how are these numbers flipped? In some sense, there's a paradox in that if you look at the total population, you ignore the subgroups, treatment A has a lower number. Treatment A looks better. But then when you look at each of the subgroups, treatment B looks better in both subgroups. This is, uh, this is Simpson's paradox. And it turns out that the numbers work out just fine. You know, the way that you get these numbers, say the 16%, The 240 is just summing up the numerators of the treatment A mild group and the treatment A severe group. And then the 1500 is just summing up the denominators, 1400 plus 100. A maybe more interesting way of writing these calculations is to, uh, so here I've massaged the calculation a bit so that I've written in terms of weightings of the big numbers in the boxes. So this 0.15 here is the 15%. Same with the 0.3 and so on. And so I've rewritten this as weightings. The 0.15 is weighted much larger than the 0.3 for the treatment A calculation. And this is just because most of the people who received treatment A had mild condition, 1,400 out of 1,500. So the 16% number that you see in the total population for treatment A is largely coming from the big weight that was put on the 15% among the mild condition people. In contrast, for treatment B, there was a much bigger weight placed on the severe group. And that's just because 500 out of 550 people who received treatment B had severe condition. And so the The 19% that you see for the treatment B in the total population is largely coming from the 20% that you see in the severe group for treatment B. Simpson's paradox largely comes from this unequal weighting, okay, from the fact that the treatment A people mostly had mild condition and the treatment B people mostly had severe condition, and people with severe condition are just more likely to die than people with mild condition. So that's why we see these flipping of the numbers. But, you know, I've kind of explained why we have the flipping of the numbers. But the question still remains, which treatment should you choose? So hold that question in your head a bit. See if you can come up with your answer to it. The spoiler is that, as I'll show you in the next few slides, the answer to this question largely depends on the causal structure of the problem. So in scenario one, um, where the causal graph is that the condition is a cause of the treatment, and also the treatment and the condition are causes of the outcome, but importantly, the condition is a cause of the treatment. In this scenario, generally, treatment B is the better choice. And I'll give you a specific example to help illustrate uh, the intuition for why this is the case. So the important thing to remember is that condition is a cause of the treatment. The example is that, say a doctor sees someone come in who has a mild condition. The doctor might then decide, for most of those people, to assign them treatment A because they want to save the more scarce treatment, treatment B, for people with more severe condition, people who are more likely to die, say. And this is why we see that among people who had mild condition, 1,400 out of 1,450 of them were assigned treatment A. Similarly, if someone comes in with severe condition, the doctor might be more likely to prescribe that person treatment B, thinking, okay, this person has severe condition, it's worth it to give them the more scarce treatment. And this is why we see that among people who have severe condition, 
500 out of 600 of them were assigned treatment B. So most of them got treatment B. Okay, so in this scenario, why is treatment B preferred? Treatment B is preferred because the reason that we are getting these this large um, 19% mortality rate among treatment B people is mainly because treatment B is disproportionately being assigned to people with severe condition who have higher chance of dying. Similarly, treatment A is disproportionately being assigned to people um, with mild condition who have a lower chance of dying. So the correct numbers to look at are the subgroup numbers, the ones in the mild and severe column. And so that's why treatment B should be preferred in this scenario, when you have condition as a cause of treatment. Now, in scenario two, the main conceptual difference is that treatment is now a cause of condition. Everything else in the causal graph is the same. Treatment and condition are still causes of the outcome. Why? Okay, and in this causal graph, treatment A is actually preferred. So I'll give you an example again to kind of illustrate the in intuition of this. So the example is that, say you're prescribed treatment B. You might have to wait a long time to actually take treatment B because it's rather scarce. And in that time while you are waiting, your condition could worsen. So say you come in with a mild condition, your condition could worsen to a severe one. That's why we see that among people who were prescribed treatment B, 500 out of 550 of them had severe condition. You know, it could have been that many of them transitioned from the treatment group, or sorry, from the mild condition to severe condition. In this example that I'm giving, it's different from the example in the previous slide. All right, so, you know, that's how treatment B could cause, could be a cause of your condition. But say you're assigned treatment A. Similarly, because treatment A is abundant, unlike treatment B, you don't have to wait at all. And so if you come in with a mild condition, you will have a mild condition probably at the time that you actually take the treatment. And that's why we see out of the 1,500 people who were assigned treatment A, 1,400 of them had mild condition. Of the 100 that severe condition, probably none transitioned from the mild condition while they were waiting. It's probably mostly just that those ones came in with severe condition. Okay, so the reason that we prefer treatment A in this setting is that the treatment is actually causing people to have a worse condition if you're given treatment B. If you're given treatment A, it's causing people to have, you know, the same condition. But so the treatment has an effect on your condition, which then has an effect on your probability of dying. So there's this effect that's going through your condition that we have to take into account. And the, uh, the way to take that into account is to look at these total numbers. So the thing to keep in mind is that treatment B is kind of bad in this example because it causes you to have a worse condition. So in this scenario, we would prefer treatment A. All right, and that concludes the uh, motivating example. So that's Simpson's paradox. A quick recap is that we prefer treatment B when the condition is a cause of treatment in this, that graph, and we prefer treatment A when the treatment is a cause of condition. So you have to decide which treatment to give your whole country. It's an important issue. It will, um, it will decide the lives of many people. And the decision hinges crucially on the causal structure of the problem. Okay, so with that, let's get into correlation does not imply causation. You've probably heard this many times before, and for machine learning people, this is prediction does not imply causation. So the example here is that, say you are looking at data of people who sleep with their shoes on and wake up with headaches, and it turns out that 
Most people who sleep with their shoes on wake up with headaches. Most people who don't sleep with their shoes on don't wake up with headaches. The two are strongly correlated, strongly associated. You might think, oh, okay, I probably shouldn't sleep with my shoes on because I don't want to wake up with a headache, that it's a, it's a cause. But, you know, what if in your data you also have information that most of the people who were going to sleep with their shoes on were also drinking pretty heavily the night before? And those same people were the ones waking up with a headache. Then you might think, oh, okay, the only reason that we're seeing this association between the two is because there's a common cause, which is drinking the night before. And there's sort of two ways to resolve in your head why shoe sleeping is so strongly correlated with waking up with a headache. And the first is that, you know, consider two groups of people, the ones who went to sleep with their shoes on. So that's the shoe sleepers and the ones who went to sleep without their shoes on, the non-shoe sleepers. These two groups of people differ in a very key way. And that is that almost everyone in the shoe sleeping group drank the night before. Almost everyone in the non-shoe sleeping group did not drink the night before. So the key way is sort of think about the average number of people who drank the night before. It's just a completely different number. And that kind of explains why we can't look at these two groups and deduce some causal effect from them. The groups are not comparable. You would want that the groups to be the same in every way except for the treatment, whether or not they went to sleep with shoes on. The other way is confounding. So because we have this common cause, it confounds the effect of shoe sleeping on waking up with a headache. And graphically, you should visualize it this way. There's this confounding association that is running between shoe sleeping and waking up with a headache. And that's the association that we observe. This is in contrast to causal association, which would be a sort of directed path from shoe sleeping to headache. The association that we observe, the total association, is a mixture of these causal and confounding associations. And correlation is just one type of association. Association here is just a synonym for statistical dependence. And correlation is technically a measure of linear statistical dependence, but people frequently use it to mean statistical dependence in general. Um, but to avoid the confusion, we're just going to use the word association rather than correlation. But yeah, just let that th sink in your minds. If you were to measure correlation or any measure of association, you would be looking at a mixture of causal and confounding association. And that additional confounding association is why correlation does not imply causation. So many of us have learned that correlation does not imply causation, but that doesn't stop us from using this heuristic all the time. Correlation equals causation is actually a cognitive bias. Okay, so in this example, where shoe sleeping is associated with a headache, you could actually just replace shoe sleeping with star, just with anything, say. So just anything associated with your headache. And this star could come from a variety of different places. One is the availability heuristic, which is another cognitive bias. And what does the availability heuristic say? It roughly says, what will come into your mind, what star will come into your mind, is just whatever is most readily available in your mind. So for example, if you recently read, say yesterday, that caffeine is associated with headaches, then you might think, oh, it's because I drank a cup of coffee earlier today. That's why I have a headache. Even if, say, two years ago, you read an article saying caffeine is not associated with headaches. That's just not nearly as available in your mind. So say you want to explain why you have a headache. You know, you have a headache and you're saying, why do I have this headache? How can I not have a headache in the future? The way we might do this is come up with some star via the availability heuristic or motivated reasoning, which I'll talk about briefly. And given that that star is associated with our headache, we'll say, okay, that explains the headache using the correlation equals causation cognitive bias. 
And motivated reasoning here is that we have some worldview that we want to come up with reasoning to justify our worldview. So an example of motivated reasoning in this case is say that I don't enjoy spending time with my in-laws. I might be motivated to attribute my headache to the time that I spent with my in-laws earlier that day. I might say, okay, I got a headache because I spent time with my in-laws earlier today, so I probably shouldn't hang out with my in-laws in the future. It gives me a reason to not do what I don't want to do, say. Okay, so that's motivated reasoning. As a, as a recap, we use correlation equals causation as a cognitive bias all the time. For example, say we want to explain something and we notice something else is associated with it, then we use correlation equals causation. Here is a real data example where we have the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool and the number of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in. And it looks like these two quantities are pretty well associated over time. So does that mean that Nicolas Cage drove people to drown themselves? Or does it mean that Nicolas Cage found out that people were drowning themselves and then he tried to make movies? to convince people not to drown themselves? Or is it neither of those, right? So it's it's probably that these two are correlated just by chance and that that one isn't really the cause of the other. So I've just told you that correlation does not imply causation. You've probably heard this several times before, but what does imply causation? So if we're doing causal inference, We have to answer this question. And that's what this section will be about. We're going to say a way to get causation. How can we know that something causes something else? How can we estimate how much of an effect does something have on something else? To do that, I'll have to introduce a new concept known as potential outcomes, which is something that is unique to causal inference. You wouldn't have seen it in regular statistics or something else before. And I'll start with just the motivation for this. So, you know, keep in mind the context is that we're inferring the effect of some treatment on some outcome. And say that in this example, you have a headache. And you know that if you were to take a pill, your headache would go away. And say that you also know that if you were to not take a pill, you would still have your headache. If you know these two things, you can probably say that there is a causal effect of the pill on your headache. The pill makes your headache go away. But what if, when you are to not take the pill, your headache still goes away? So your headache goes away regardless of whether or not you take the pill then you might say that the pill does not have any causal effect. Maybe it's just a sugar pill. So this is the intuition for potential outcomes. And we'll now get a bit more precise with specific notation for this. We'll use do t equals 1 to denote taking the pill. And we'll use do t equals 0 to denote not taking the pill. The outcome that you would observe if you were to take the pill is this first one, and the outcome that you would observe if you were to not take the pill is the second one. We'll use simpler notation for this, so just yi1 as the potential outcome if you were to take the pill, and yi0 as the potential outcome if you were to not take the pill. And then we can define the causal effect as just the difference between these two potential outcomes. So the causal effect of taking the pill on your headache is just this difference between potential outcomes. So I think it's worth taking some time to make sure that sinks in and that you understand this because potential outcomes are a new concept. This notation is a new notation that you wouldn't have seen before if you haven't seen causal inference before. However, there is a fundamental problem here. So say that yi1 equals 1. So that means that if we're to take the pill, 
then head 8 goes away. And yi0 equals 0, which means that if you're to not take the pill, you would still have your headache. So 1 means headache, 0 means not headache. The fundamental problem here is that say you were to not take the pill, you can't actually observe what would have happened if you were to take the pill. We'll call that a counterfactual. And because you can't observe that, you can't compute this causal effect. Similarly, if you were to take the pill, you can't observe what would have happened if you were to not take the pill. And same as last time, you will not be able to compute this causal effect because you only have access to one of the terms in this difference. This is known as the fundamental problem of causal inference. So we'll denote that difference we we're just looking at as the individual treatment effect because there's a specific I, where I stands for a specific individual. But how can we get around this? Maybe we can take an average of this. So if we take an average over I, um, you, know, you can use linearity of expectation to get this equation. And then you would like that this difference between potential outcomes is equal to a difference between conditional expectations. But unfortunately, in general, it is not. And this is because correlation does not imply causation, right? So because we have this confounding association here, and these conditional expectations are just a measure of association. This first quantity is a causal quantity, but the second quantity is not causal. It is a mixture of say, the confounding association and the causal association. And this is mainly the case because we have confounding. When we have confounding, then these two quantities are not equal to each other. We can't just look at the difference between conditional expectations. Well, what if there were no arrow going from C to T? What if C were not a cause of treatment? Then we wouldn't have any confounding association be fantastic. And it turns out that's exactly what randomized control trials do. So a randomized control trial is where an experimenter randomizes subjects into a treatment group or a control group. And the way that they choose which group a specific subject is in is by, say, a coin flip, just some random number generator. That means that T, so your treatment, is only determined by a coin flip. It can't have any causal parents. It's completely random. Another way of viewing that is that the treatment groups must be comparable. So if you think back to the chew sleeper example, and waking up with a headache and drinking, the problem there is that the shoe sleepers were not comparable to the non-shoe sleepers because most of the shoe sleepers were drinking the night before, whereas most of the non-shoe sleepers were not. But if you were to randomize whether someone wears shoes or not when they are going to bed, so say you went into their rooms, you get these drunk people, you flip a coin for whether or not you're going to take their shoes off, or you get these sober people and you flip a coin for whether or not you're going to sneakily put shoes on them or not while they're sleeping, then what that would do, it was it would make the drunk people evenly distributed across the two groups, across the ones that have shoes on when they're sleeping and the ones that don't have shoes on. Then the groups are comparable. Okay, so randomization here makes the groups comparable. Comparable groups is good because then you can get causal effects. And so that's what this says right here. When there is no confounding, the ADE, the average treatment effect, is equal to the difference in conditional expectations. Okay, so at the top of the side, we have the in general, these are not equal. But at the bottom, we have that when there is no confounding, such as when you do a randomized control trial, then they are equal. You know, randomization is sort of magical in the sense when you can do an experiment, causal inference is easy. Even for any other variable, so, so here we just have C. But if there's any other variables that we don't observe, 
randomization will also take care of those variables. They can't be causes of T. T can't have any causal parents because it's just determined by a coin flip. Randomization takes care of all of those unobserved variables as well. All right, so I mean, that's what does imply causation. A randomized experiment is one way of getting causation. But um, that's, you know, that's not where a lot of research is done, and, and uh, we'll see why. So observational studies are where you're just given a data set. And this data set is not gathered by you. You know, it's just gathered by someone and they give it to you. And this person probably wasn't doing an experiment. So ideally you would have that the that C here is not a cause of treatment because then you don't have any confounding. But in general, in observational studies, you're going to have some confounding pretty much all of the time. And... The problem is that you can't always randomize treatment. So randomizing treatment would give you this ideal, but there are some reasons why you can't do it. For example, it could be unethical. Say you want to measure the effect of smoking on lung cancer. It could be unethical to randomly assign people to smoke. Or even, or it could even be infeasible. Say you want to measure the causal effect of say, capitalism versus communism on uh, GDP. In order to do this, because communism capitalism would be assigned at the country level, you would have to be a dictator of the world. You'd have to be able to just assign whole countries to economic systems. And, you know, that doesn't seem impossible. You know, I could imagine that maybe someone could be that um, powerful, but it certainly seems infeasible. And then there's things that are just impossible. Say you want to measure the effect of someone's DNA at birth on their probability of getting breast cancer. Maybe in the future you might be able to change their DNA at the time that you do the study. But absent a time machine, you'll never be able to change their DNA at birth. And there's all this stuff that could happen that their DNA could cause between their birth and now. So it's actually impossible to randomize their DNA at birth and uh, do a causal effect that way. And then one that's not on this slide, but it's just more convenient to do observational studies. It's really expensive to do randomized experiments. Some of us, like in computer science, we don't even know how to do that. We have to go through ethics boards and stuff. That's, that just doesn't sound fun. So observational studies are really important because we can't always randomize treatment and they're just generally more convenient. But that leaves us with a really natural question. How do we measure causal effects in observational studies? And the solution is what you might expect to adjust or control for confounders. But what does that mean? Well, I'm going to use W for um, the confounders here. And if W is a sufficient adjustment set, which I'll say a bit more about what that means in the next slide, then we have this equation. The expected potential outcome under treatment small t in the subpopulation where W equals little w is equal to expected value of y given t comma w. This bit in the middle here is just a new notation that I'm introducing here. So I mean, it uses the do that you saw before, and this is a notation that you would see in the, the do notation, essentially. It means the same thing as this potential outcome quantity here. Okay, but the important thing is that when we condition on W, we get something that has no causal quantities in it. It's just regular Y, expected value of Y given T comma W. And why is this? It's because in this picture down here, the confounding association is blocked when you condition on W. So the shading here refers to conditioning, and W is C in this case. In the next slide, we'll have W is a set of variables that's a bit more complex. Okay, but this quantity is still conditioned on W. What if you just want the average potential outcome? Expected value of Y, T. Well, it turns out that the solution there is just to marginalize out W. Just take an expectation over W and uh, 
this W here is now a random variable. So you're just taking a w expectation over W of this quantity up here. That gives you the marginal, uh, the marginal average potential outcome. And then here's the do notation version of it, which that's what we'll be using on this slide. Okay, so we gave one example where W is C. C is a sufficient adjustment set there. And in this slide, I'll just be using shaded nodes as examples of sufficient adjustment sets. There'll be multiple nodes sometimes, but shaded also means conditioning, which, you know, that's what we're doing. We're conditioning on W in this formula. What if you have a graph like this? So it has multiple paths along which confounding association flows. One way that you could block those is by controlling for C and W2. There are other ways though. You could also control for C and W1. Notice that it blocks the association even sooner here. So w, W2 looked like that and W1 looks like that. And what does this do? It isolates the causal association. Just like if you were to remove these edges from T, you know, randomize T, you get the same thing. Okay, and uh, you could even also control for W3. Makes no difference here. And then as a final thing, uh, which I won't go into deal here, detail here, if you have a sort of V-like structure like this, then you don't need to control for Z2, for example. Actually, you don't want to control for Z2, and we'll, we'll see this more in the course. But for now, that's just a quick warning. Now that we've gone through how to get these causal quantities using this adjustment formula here, uh, we can actually go back to the COVID-27 example and calculate these. So I've copy and pasted the formula up here, and we're going to be looking at the scenario where the causal graph is the one where condition is a cause of treatment. You might remember that from scenario two, we could also consider a scenario where treatment is a cause of condition, but that's not the one we'll be looking at. So the sufficient adjustment set here is C. We have to condition on C and then marginalize over it. And because C is a discrete variable, it only takes on two values, we can talk about a sum over C. So this outer expectation over C turns into a sum over C times probability of C, and then we have this inner expectation. And then we can add this causal column. So this column makes it clear that treatment B is preferable to treatment A in this scenario. And as you see under these columns, I actually list what all of them are. So this one is expected value of Y given do T the causal quantity. All these other quantities are non-causal. Well, you can treat these two as causal, but I, uh, they don't have do operators in them, for example. So now that we have this column, like, we can actually go through the calculation. And the way that we do this calculation, here are just the numbers listed here, but I'll walk you through it, is we first want to get the expected value of y given t comma c. And t corresponds to the row where c corresponds to the column. So the expected value of y given those two is just this number in the box. So 15% here. So that's where we get the 0.15 and that's where we get the 0.1 here. And then we multiply that by the marginal probability of your condition. So you have to add up the total number of people in the population 1,400 plus 100 plus 500 plus 50 gives you 2,050. And then in the numerator, put the number of people with that condition. So for mild condition, it's 1,400 plus 50. That's how we get 1,450 here, 2,050 here. And notice that it's the same for both treatment and for both treatment A and treatment B, we use the same weight. Okay. And then for the severe condition, it's the same thing, right? So the expected value of y given t comma c is just 0.3 and 0.2 here and here. And then we're still going to have 2,500 people in the denominator. And then in the numerator, we will have 100 plus 500 equals 600 people. And that's how we get these results. So let's maybe compare that to the numbers that we got 
when we just naively took the total column. So the way we get this 16% and 19% in the total column is we took the same conditional expectations as we used here in the causal estimate, same conditional expectations. So those are all the numbers in the parentheses, but then we gave them different weightings. And this is why in the beginning, I wrote this calculation of the total column in terms of these weighted averages. Or, yeah, these are weighted averages, right? Since, since these are, um, the denominator is the same between these two, and then the numerators add to the denominator. Okay, and the difference is that in this naive example, we have a complete different weight given to the mild group between treatment A and treatment T, sorry, in treatment B, whereas in the causal example, we give the exact same weight to the mild group in both treatment A and treatment B. Same thing in the severe condition group. We give the exact same weight to treatment A and treatment B, whereas in the naive example, that's what we use to compute the total column, we give a much larger weight to the severe group in treatment B than in treatment A. That's why the naive numbers are bad. That's why they're wrong in uh, when condition is a cause of treatment. So I encourage you to go back and look at these numbers. I think that staring at them a bit, maybe doing them yourself, can give you some useful intuition, at least for Simpson's paradox. And this is something that we will go more into detail in the first few weeks of the course. This will probably be about week two. All right, well, with that, welcome to Causal Inference. If you want to join the course mailing list, go to causalcourse.com. 